<laughs> okay, um, my presentation is a little bit longer than the introduction, I hope. Uh, I get that, why we chose it, where we ended up. Let's see if it's still working. Yeah. We're talking a little bit about assumptions, about automatically things happening. To boldly go, and that's not a spelling error, but we had really some people that were really having some hair issues. Uh, entering the level of dragons and where we have quality <coughs> issue. We like to fight in our office as well. Uh, by the way, this is where I work. A lot of these uh, posters will be uh, visible around the cafe uh, currently. If you listen to the radio, you can also get this, uh, these ads. That's where I work. I'm a uh, lead ops. And I'm the one responsible for all the infrastructure together with my team. And I was the one involved with this whole game. Uh, why we want to choose it. Uh, but in the end, I'm only using a fraction of it, and the developers are really using it. Uh, and they're still happy with it, I must say. <laughs> so it's a true force day tale. And force day will become more obvious later on by force day. And uh, yeah, it's also a little bit fictitious, it's a little bit exaggerated, so don't take it for the full truth, but it's based on a true story. Um, 42 slides. That's my promise. <laughs> Just to keep it a little bit slow. I don't have the raindrops splashing down, but it's a little bit of a problem. Next time. <laughs> and I'm not going to carry it down, but I especially made it 42. <coughs> um, and this is my story. It's about these subjects. Those trees look a bit like Sorry? Those trees. Yeah, there are trees, a little bit like raindrops, but those are trees. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is Thor, and that's also the Thor thing coming from. And I will tell a little bit why why we chose it. Thor is the reason, or is part of the reason why we chose it. Um, when I came uh, working for uh, for my uh, we ran an infrastructure on DCOS and Debian. DCOS, it's a uh, yeah. Both operating system and also uh, running Apache uh, Mesos. It's an infrastructure system. It's running Docker all over the place. Um, but it was not feeling right at that time. It was uh, still outdated. It was very hard to maintain. Um, there were not all the uh, updates were applied. They tried to do it sometimes, but it was a little bit like uh, scary. Uh, I was a new guy, so it was more like, okay, if we're going to change it, we want to change it, let's change it then. And then to something that we know and that it also helps, uh, helps me with burning the whole new system. So we thought, what, what, we, uh, what we want to do? Debian of a DCOS is quite difficult, so let's try something easy, a little bit more simple. Kubernetes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, did we have an issue with that? But it was nice, it was nice for the resumes that we were working on it. Uh, this was our whole stack, our whole chain, our pipeline. Everything was hosted on GitHub. We uh, do the builds on Travis. Basically, what we do there was building the whole uh, Docker image. Then we pushed it to, to Docker Hub. And then we pushed it to DCOS. Nice pipeline. But every time we had a new project, uh, all the developers were like, crap, I had to create a new project and I had to configure every step of it. So it's a little bit hard to do. And we had a little bit more repos, so if you're on Docker Hub and you have more than 100 repos, more than 100 uh, containers, uh, it's a little bit crappy to search <coughs> for it as well. Yeah, and this year this was going to change the Kubernetes and we had to do something regarding that whole thing. Because, yeah, hmm, it was not quite fitting. Uh, this US was also running some, uh, some spot of uh, work, so we, had, we wanted to do something with it. And, um, there was this objective, part of the objective was, okay, we want to have 75% reduction in steps needed for developers to go from scratch to have deployed. Because it was like this, yeah, they were really holding back to starting on the projects, <coughs> to make it a little bit more easy. So Tor, and we first thought about Tor, it was a nice name, it was a nice logo, and then we thought, okay, how can we make Tor something meaningful? So in this case, <laughs> saving and harmonizing our releases. <laughs> it happened too much. <laughs> so we first came with the icon, then we had the name, and then we had something like, okay, how are we going to really 
forward to projects. Um, yeah, then we found these nice screens on, on Git, uh, on GitLab. Nice, auto DevOps, Kubernetes, nice shine. Let's, let's go with GitLab. That was the proposal. We didn't do any investigation, we just looked at the screen and said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. You tested on production. Uh, we find out in production. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's the only testing environment. So we have these uh, three applications being replaced by, by GitLab because A, nice uh, built in integration and whatever. And the side effect is also cheaper than the whole stack. So one application, less money, more fun. So our journey. Um, this is a uh, windmill. And it's also part of, okay, new energy. Let's, uh, let's get some uh, nice start. It also happens to be one of the other products that are undermined sales. Not only in the hosting part, but also in the, in the energy business. So we have this, uh, this whole stack. GitHub, authorization, naming. GitHub is more like a yes, single folder and everything is in there. GitLab, you have nice uh, folder structures you can use. So one of the things, okay, when we're going to move from one repository to the other one, let's also retry to rename everything. Nice setup. That was not our proposal, that was from the developers themselves. Uh, so they had to come up with a completely new name and convention. And yet a little more than over 10 repository stories. So it was quite a challenge in that as well. Uh, the builds were different, the whole structure was different, so we had some investigation to do. Yeah, how is this going to move from one, uh, one stack to the other one? Uh, which request, pull request, that kind of things happening in the lot of place. Uh, repositories, well, what's a repository in, in uh, GitLab? Things are made differently than it is on the Docker Hub. So it was more like, okay, searching and yeah, really getting confused with the terminology with, uh, with each other. And like I said, we had some, uh, we spoke uh, software on DCOS to really get the deployment there because we really pushed it automatically to DCOS. And there were a lot of assumptions in that software as well. Because you, yeah, you normally you have only one single environment. Now with this DCOS, uh, the registry where the, the containers are living, where the images are living, it's a different uh, path that you're using. You have to use different tokens, you have two different authorizations. So we had to really rebuild it. And we had this nice screen where you could say, okay, this is the one in acceptance, this is the one in production, but it only counts the one. We have about 15 characters for the whole name. GitLab, it ran all over the screen. So that's bespoke software we really had to touch. And it was quite fun because it was running uh, a lot of hours in the beginning because well, all the assumptions we had were really yeah, all the times proved differently. Then came a uh, move. We had over 200 repositories in GitLab. Um, five days to do everything. Production was still going on. We're moving from GitHub to GitLab. Nice. Crap. <laughs> really crap. Um, that was the day that GitHub was taken over by Microsoft and we had to make <laughs> shit out. The whole repository database was gone. So we wanted to create a token, it was created. You wanted to look it up, it was gone. On the first day of the migration. Really, really fun. Um, we also had some problems with some production, so some developers were taking the project as well, so with a little bit less capacity to do it. Um, GitLab has an option to do import. It also has block import. But what it doesn't do is that you can say, okay, I have all these 200 different repositories and I want to move all to a different namespace. So the guy who was forgetting to check that had to do it for every 200 by end. So that was also a nice start. Um, GitLab was also having issues. Autoscaling was not working on the GitLab environment. Everybody was complaining. In the morning it was quite okay, but then other countries were waking up, so no autoscaling. So all the, all the production, all the runners, where all the builds were taking place, well, it was not happening. It took hours before <coughs> the build was even executed. You're, you're, you're running on-prem or 
Det er fuldt hørst. Fuldt hørst. Fuldt hørst. Det er hørst. Man må ikke lade betale. Ja, okay. absolut. Så so, I'm going to have some issues on the other scale. Like, one is we tried something that run us on the Kubernetes on the platform that we were running. Um, but it was not really working because the Kubernetes runner does need some other different uh, configuration than the normal Docker runners. And we couldn't really get it to work. So finally, in the end, I found some hosting company in the Netherlands that for about five euros a month we could uh, get a runner up and running. And that helped us through the whole process. But initially, we had about one, 20 repos in two days, with about six people helping out with the migration. <coughs> looking good, really looking good. When we tested that, okay, we had some raw calculation, 15 minutes for migration, translating the whole YAML file, where the build is taking place. Okay, let's do it times two, because some people are getting off, uh, slacking off. So, we ended up, it should only be one in about two days. And yet, we really needed the full five days to really make it work. But it was a nice experience. We learned a lot from that. Um, just by replacing that whole pipeline by a new set, we already got 25% of our objective of the 75% reduction. So that was quite nice. Took some time, took some sweat. No tears yet, but. Nice, uh, journey, second part. Yeah. Good question. Uh, were the YAML files for the Travis so much, uh, pretty much the same as the ones used by the internet for? Because you said almost, line. almost. Uh, uh, they were different enough that we could not automate it. And um, yeah, because developers are doing things per web program a little bit differently. Uh, it's not like you have the same YAML file and everything the same. It's a little bit different everywhere, so we could not automate it. But basically, a lot of things could be copy pasted and uh, quite quickly set up. Uh, what we also did in that part, you can create your own uh, uh, image where the, the build takes a start from. So, what we already did is put a lot of the tooling that we used, put it in that image, so that was a lot easier to, to really generate. Our journey, the second one, I talked about in my introduction also about auto DevOps. We also do autos, we also do private cards. So, again, about assumptions, things that are happening. Auto DevOps, WTF. These screens I mentioned before, we had a closer look at those things. What is it really about? Can it help us? How does it work? Um, there's this nice option that where you can generate an Auto DevOps demo file for GitLab. It's quite nice until you see it has over 900 lines of code in it. Really cool. And we have an existing build environment. So there's a lot of assumptions going on in that file as well. And you can do a lot of variables that you say, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. So we gave it a try and we ended up about having about 30 variables that we had to set to really make it work a little bit like we wanted to do. Then we got a close look at the whole YAML file. Okay, we have about five lines we can really use, the rest we tossed it all away. So what the DevOps is quite nice if you're using a really green environment where you really start from scratch. If you have a really existing environment where you do things differently, where the assumptions is different from Git, uh, from GitLab, yeah, then you end with something that you really don't want to maintain. Um, you can connect it to Kubernetes. You can say, okay, let's uh, let GitLab generate my Kubernetes cluster. <coughs> But basically, it's like, okay, let's get out all of the passwords and secrets from my repositories, but at the same time, handing over your pin code and your master key to GitLab to really control your full production environment. It has full cluster admin capabilities required to really make it work. Well, this is the hosted version of GitLab, uh, for GitLab. Ah, I don't like it that much. So, yeah, there is an integration possible, but it's, it's not on the level that we want to have it. Um, it wants to use Helm Tiller to do all the deployments. When we were running around with uh, with Kubernetes, we also had a look at the Helm deployment. It's quite fun to have it, but have the Tiller component running all the time in the cluster where everybody can do everything. Ah, it's not something we want to do. So we want to have a different look at what we're going to do there as well. So we're not using this part of the deployment part or the integration part of Kubernetes. We're doing it a little bit different. Uh, 
it can also connect to Prometheus for getting metrics about your application that you're deploying. It's quite fun, but the Prometheus API is unprotected. Yeah, you can protect it with your own ingress, with your own base auth. But I cannot get any of those details into that screen. So I really cannot use with the hosted version, I cannot really use those metrics. So it's a little bit like, okay, all the things that we said, hey, that's why you want to use GitLab in the first place. Yeah, not so quite. This one is a very nice uh, mm -hmm. issue that's been posted to, uh, to the GitLab uh, environment. It's far too opinionated. Well, that's something we can fully subscribe to. It's, it's really about all the assumptions, all the things that are happening. And if you're yeah, starting from a greenfield situation, it's quite okay. If you're using it for an existing situation, yeah, that's more like working around all the stuff. So this is really a nice one. It's about, okay, we have, uh, you can only have one connection to the Kubernetes environment. There's one namespace where every team is running. So if you have two teams running it in different stats, you can say, I can use different permission sets. It's all about, it's all about it, basically. Can it only be deployed to Kubernetes or also to Firebase or whatever you um, That's not built in. Within the script you can do basically everything, but this one is only about Kubernetes and basically it's only about Kubernetes on Google. All the other stuff, yeah, it can work, but there's a lot of assumptions. It's only about Google, it's only about this, it's only about that. Um, FRL, you're also registry, not Amsterdam. You also have created create it in the past. But this is a little bit about the wrap up where we ended up. There's a lot of things like we don't like it, but there's also some stuff we certainly do like to get that. Um, all the time, it's all about assumptions. We, you see something on the website, you assume a lot of things, and later on you figure out oh, it's not quite what the truth is all about or what I thought it would be. All this automatic auto simplification, yeah, if you adhere to the assumptions, then it works. Otherwise, you have to do it yourself. And really, discovering things, uh, auto DevOps is still quite in, in, in the whole lab. So everybody's still experiencing things. We really like about the replacement of the many tools with one tool. That is cheaper, it's more like a nice side effect. It's not the real the main objective. But that having one, uh, one environment, first, what we first initially had to do, you had to create something in, on, on GitHub, then you had to configure it and uh, authorize it on the next stack, then you had to authorize it, configure it on the next stack before it works. Now we have one single tool, one everything is in there. Yeah, we still have to do a lot of scripting around it uh, to make it really work like the way we want to do. Uh, one of the things what we have included on our own environment is uh, source graph, for example, to really be able to search across all the different repositories, because that's possible with the host version. Sorry? Plain text code search. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because basically, after two days, when we were afforded the first developer came, hey, can I search across all repositories? It was never asked before. <laughs> but source graph, open source, it works quite, quite nice. Um, what we also quite like is this overview of all the build stages and what you can do around that. That you can really go to see what is built, what's production, that you can go to staging. But there's also a manual step there, that you can say, okay, first it's staging, it wants to test, and then I hit the button to go to the next stage. This environment is not a code, or we can define uh, our own environments? Ba basically, these things are from your build uh, yeah. definition. So you can really play around with those. And uh, we did a small demo for our own developers. And we created this very nice deployed to production environment. Uh, it's called Sleep. And that was very beautiful for the whole development demonstration. So we could really say, okay, it's built to stage and we deploy it. We hit a button and it goes to the screen and sleep in it and yeah, we deploy it. <laughs> we have some time issues to make it fully work, but it's quite okay. Could you also um, implement rollbacks with this? So if it turns out that something goes wrong with the production? 
There, there are some options uh, available for that. Um, again, they say out of the box, but it's basically in the whole script that you do a lot of those, uh, those things. You can do a lot of things, also canary releases, you can yeah, build it into this kind of, uh, into this kind of flows. But it's quite hard, and basically if you have new tooling, you should use that one. Uh, you have uh, a fan that does a lot of the uh, testing, for example. Yes, you can use this, but it's really like, yeah, not so much. This one, personalized one, really was nice for us. It's really, really good to achieve already a lot of reduction in the steps. We're going to reduce a little bit more with all the automation that we're going to do around it. A little bit further more. And also sanitize some of the procedures of development itself. But in the end, this is what we do. What we can do the domain hosting and stuff like that. Well, like I promised. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Are they selling the dev domain already? <laughs> uh, it's, it's not available yet, but it's upcoming. It's upcoming, yeah. And we're, we're going to sell it as well, so just wait for it. Okay. Would you choose GitLab? Uh, you choose that over again? Uh, would I choose it over again? Yes. Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, because there were some, some issues again, like with, uh, with the Docker uh, registry, yes, we could host something around us. And, and what we're going to do is that we move a lot of stuff to other places with uh, the SaaS. So the Docker, that was really a relief for, for the developers. Uh, that everything is in one place is quite, quite easy. The uh, GitLab YAML, um, where you build the whole pipeline with, is, is quite a page. It's just doing a lot of work on that side as well, but GitLab has it already in it. Uh, is GitLab perfect? By far, no. There's still a lot of things that you really want to uh, define on a project level, uh, on a folder level, uh, and can only be done on a uh, project level, on a repository level. For example, some certain kind of callbacks of configuration, what you want to achieve. Uh, deployment tokens are a pain in the ass, uh, especially if you want to use uh, images, because it's specific to only one repository. And if you want to say, okay, I have microservices and I want to have five of these repositories, then you screw it and basically you have to use something like a special user. So there's still a lot of work going on that level. Um, but yeah, in the end, we still would want to, uh, you know, to use it. We still would uh, want to use it, absolutely. Yeah. You already mentioned it a little bit in your presentation. They are, they have this or uh, around them of not being very stable. What's, what are your latest experiences on that with their hosting? Um, well, we, we started to look more into that and uh, basically what we did, we had the Slack channel and we subscribed also to the two RSS feeds, uh, both of, of GitHub and GitLab, still of GitLab, also on Travis, and basically it's more or less the same. Okay. Um, what I see is that they're becoming more and more stable, more and more professional, they have to. You really see that they, uh, they are growing. But basically, you see with every service that they are having major issues. Uh, like we had on, on the migration part, this whole meta repository that was, that was wrong, that was yeah, quite a bummer. And basically, you saw that also the Travis was affected by that as well because none of the built triggers made it to the Travis. So, if you have two companies or three companies in the chain, that's really hurt as well. Um, was everybody happy about the initial choice for, for GitLab? No, we had to struggle in the past, running some, something like backup or whatever it was with, with GitLab. But yeah, it, that can happen to most of the companies, and now they're more, more stable, more professional than that level. Um, auto scaling, yeah, was a pain in the ass, but they solved it quite quickly. Okay, works for us. Do you use your own GitLab runners or provide them by the GitLab itself? At the moment, still by, uh, by the, in, initially we had our own GitLab runner as well, but because we want to run it on Kubernetes, it does require some workarounds to really make it work in, yeah, in combination with the shared runners. But in the end, I think we're moving towards our own runners, because we can do a little bit more like uh, security in it, for the deployment, the production, stuff like that. Uh, but what we see overall, it's, it's faster than Travis. 
Yeah, we do have some builds that take about 45 minutes, but those are really Asian PHP environments where they do a lot of things that should not happen in one repository. Uh, for example, they create a big stack, including Elasticsearch. You make a test run, well, yeah, that mm -hmm. tends to end up a little bit to the build time. Do you trust their 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 backup and the type of uh, facilities, or do you also make like own exports of all your configuration in there? Um, well, basically, all the repositories are already semi backups because they are also the new developer uh, laptops. Uh, we are not creating our own backups uh, in addition to that, so we trust in them to do that. How much configuration is there outside of the repository? Is it that all those scripts are there? Yeah, there's only uh, some small uh, variable data that is not in repositories, but basically everything else we want to really push them into the repositories. And by using it more like this, uh, if you look at it right now, a lot of the configuration that we have in the DCOS to make it run is now living outside of the repository. It's not moving inside. So basically, we are improving on that. Time for beer, I guess. Yeah. <laughs>